next Sunday I will be on vacation. David will be preaching for me. And then November 5th we will be with Odell. And then the following Sunday we will start the Disciples' Mission. And we will conclude that this year. And I hope that's been a profitable study for you as we've learned uh, what it means to, uh, to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. Uh, next year, uh, I haven't, I can be honest with you, I haven't planned Christmas yet, but I've, I've planned uh, next year's series. Is, uh, I am doing a series uh, the, throughout the whole year uh, called, the, uh, called The Disciples' House, and it's building a life that counts. And we're going to look, first of all, next year at the foundation, which is Jesus Christ. And then we're going to build on that foundation by abiding in Him. How do we build on that foundation? We abide in Christ. And then our structure, our columns, will be faith, hope, and love. How do I live by faith so that I am uh, putting on the new man and taking off the old constantly? And then we look at love, and by love we want to develop the mind of Christ so we can learn how Christ wants us to interrelate or to relate to other people. And then we will look at hope, and we will look at uh, putting on the full armor of God. And then we will finish all that, and we'll put the roof on our house uh, by talking about our witness to the world. And so that's going to take us all 2018 to do. Uh, so I hope you're looking forward to that. But And uh, like I said this morning, I've already actually started working on a daily Bible reading for each of those messages throughout the year next year. So uh, I hope uh, that uh, you will uh, find that profitable in your life today. The final message on the disciples' path to life as we look at spreading the good news. And how do we spread the good news in a bad news world? We have to admit we live in a bad news world, don't we? There's a lot of junk going on constantly in our world to remind us that man, our society today is far from God. And, and you don't have to, you, you, that, that's not being judgmental, that's just, that's seeing the truth. We're far from God. But there's good news. We're not the only ones who had to be a witness for the Lord Jesus Christ in, the, in a society that's far from God. Uh, the Apostle Peter uh, wrote 1 Peter to a church uh, that was ministering in a culture that was very far from God. Uh, Rome at that time uh, was not only... Uh, not only worshipped the emperor and other gods, uh, they were persecuting Christians. Uh, they were putting Christians to death. Uh, and so Peter gives us some good insights in how do we share the good news in a bad news world. In chapter 3, beginning at verse 13, Peter reminds us and he tells us, now who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled. But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect. Having a good conscience so that, so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. Well, let's pray together. Father, this letter was written to a church, but Lord, we are the church, and so this letter is written to us. It's not just written by the Apostle Peter. He was writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And so this letter is not only from Peter to us, this letter is from you to us. You have a word for us today. 
A word that we need so desperately to hear. Because it seems like we are losing ground rather than gaining ground in our culture. Hmm. Lord, we want to be the generation that experiences a great revival and a great awakening. We want to be that generation that a hundred years from now people can look back and say, that's when it happened. That's when it happened. And it happened because Christians were living faithfully to your word. And so, Father, I pray that, that we would be found faithful. That we would be found faithful to live out what you've called us to be. For we ask it in Christ's name. Amen. We've been talking about disciplining ourselves. And if, we, and if we are going to spread the good news of the gospel in our community, in our world, uh, we are going to have to discipline ourselves to do that. And so Peter reminds us in this passage of, of Scripture some things that, that, that we must have in our lives, some things that we must do in order that we might be prepared to share the good news with those around us. And the first thing he tells us is, he says, I, I, I need you to be passionate for righteousness. Be passionate for righteousness. Look at what he says in verse 13. But who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? If you're, living a, if you're living a good life and if you're doing the right things, most people will leave you alone. They, they, won't, they won't harm you if, if you're doing good. And Paul says, you know, Peter says, excuse me, that you need to be, you need to be zealous. You, 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 need to be, you need to be passionate for doing good. You, you, need to, you need to do what is right in the world. If you're, going to, if you're going to spread the good news in a bad news world, then you need to bring a lot of good news, and that good news is the things that you do. In the Old Testament, in, in Jeremiah uh, chapter 29, God speaks to Jeremiah and He says, I want you to write a letter to the, to the captives in Babylon. You know, if you remember with me that that the children of the, 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 the southern kingdom of Judah had sinned against God and God raised up Babylon to provide to bring judgment on them. And, and how they brought judgment was they took the people out of their land and, and they 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 took them back to Babylon. And, and God told Jeremiah, he said, Now Jeremiah, write a letter to those captives in Babylon. And tell them a few things for me. Tell them, first of all, that, that there's going to be some people who are going to say to you, this is not going to last very long. That God's going to rescue you. And, and so, you don't, 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 you know, just stay completely out of Babylon. You're there, but don't, don't, don't do anything there. Because this is not going to last long. And, and God says to Jeremiah, just tell the people, you're going to be there 70 years. So you're going to be there for a while. And he says to them, he says, he says to them, let the wealth, you know, he says, let the welfare of the city be your welfare. What is it? What the verse says literally, he says, uh, sit, he says, where's my passage? <laughs> he says, but seek the welfare of the city, Jeremiah 29, verse 7, where I have sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf for its welfare. You, in its welfare, you will find your welfare. He's saying, he's saying, listen, while you're there, seek the welfare of the city. Seek to, seek to make the city a better place to live. 
seek to, to make the city a, a, a more prosperous place because when it's a better place to live, it's going to be a better place to live for you. And I think that's a word for us today. For we are, in a sense, in a Babylonian captivity. You know, we are not home. We are exiles in this land. Our home is in heaven, but we are here, and, and the welfare of our city is our welfare. And so we are to do good. We are to see the things that are going on in our world, and we ought to seek to make a difference in them. You know, we complain a lot about what's happening in the world, don't we? But how much do we do to make a difference? We, you know, just for example, we, we complain a lot about the education system. Well, what do we do to make a difference? Do we volunteer as Christians? Do we go and help? And do we tutor? Do we do all those things? You see, when we do those good things, we are helping our city and, and we're helping ourselves as well. And so we are to be passionate about doing good. Why? Because most people will leave you alone. If you're doing good, they're not going to harm you. And in our world today, if we're going to spread the good news, we need, to, we need to be passionate about doing things that are good for our city and for the people that are living around us. We need to, to help them. And so my question this morning is, what good can you do this week? Can you do some good for somebody in your sphere of influence? You know, you've got people that you see around. Can you do something good for them? You know, when, when, when you're in the checkout line and, and, and the person is in front of you, you're in the express line and the person in front of you has 20 items in the 12 item <coughs> lane and, and they're complaining to the cash cashier and giving them a hard time uh, because... Uh, uh, you know, and, 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 and you know, they're, they're giving them a hard time. Can you then be, do something good for that cashier and just bless her or him and say, thank you, man, you're doing a great job. You know, when you're in the line at McDonald's and, you know, you're fast food, and you're thinking this is fast food and it's taking 30 minutes and, and you're expecting only 10 and when you get your meal, you're just in a grumpy mood because you were hungry. Instead of being in a grumpy mood, can we just say something nice and bless that person and do something good for them? Can we do something good for our neighbors? Can we do something good for, for people around us? Pop Peter says, be passionate about that. He said, always be looking for something good to do for somebody. Is that, is that how you see life? Or, or are you like me too much? And I, I confessed my sin last week. Uh, you know, a lot of places, my, my goal is to get in and get out and keep my head down and duck low so nobody notices me. Uh, you know, that's, that's normally, that's my M.O. And so God is saying to me this morning, again, Steve, you can't do that. Be passionate about looking for ways to do good for people. So that you can spread the good news. But not only be passionate about doing good be, for righteousness, uh, be persistent, be persistent with your convictions. Now notice what he says here. He, he says, but even if you should, verse 14, but even if you should suffer for righteousness sake, you will be blessed. Now, what is he saying? He's saying that, that sometimes you will get in trouble for doing good. You will do good things and people will harm you. Jesus said that in the, in, in, in the uh, uh, Beatitudes. Blessed are you who are persecuted for what? Righteousness sake. You will at times face, face opposition for doing good. I, I, I got an email uh, last week or week before last from uh, Love Life Charlotte and, and they were asking us to, to write a letter or to, to sign on to a letter to the city attorney because the mayor of Charlotte uh, has decided to, 
to, to make uh, this such a big issue that, that she wants to pass a law that says you can no longer park your car on Latrobe Drive and it will be against the law for you to stand on that street in front of the abortion clinic. Well, that's a little thing. Is it a good thing to seek to help people choose life? Yes. But here they're coming after it. Why? Because in this world, what happens? Our world sometimes will call evil good and call good evil. But you've got to be persistent in your convictions. You got, your convictions have to say, this is right and this is good, even if the world is against it. You can't compromise truth. You can't compromise your convictions. If your convictions are grounded in the Word of God, you cannot compromise them. You must be persistent with them and say, I'm still going to do good even if the world says what I'm doing is wrong. You see, our world today says what? That it's wrong for you to say that there is only one way to salvation. Our world says, you know, we've got to be tolerant of everyone. And so you can't tell them that, 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 that their belief is wrong. Well, the, the, <laughs> yes, you can. Because their belief is wrong. And it's wrong for me not to tell them that it's wrong. Because if I don't warn them, then there's no possibility that they would change their minds. And so I have, to, I have to be persistent and say, even if the world says this is wrong, I am still going to do what is right, no matter the consequence. Now, does God save us from the consequences? Sometimes yes, and sometimes no. The Hebrew midwives... You know, they, they, they stood for what is right. They were not going to have the baby boys killed. Daniel, God did shut the uh, lion's mouth. You know, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego still had to go into the furnace, even though they were saved from it. Peter and John were still brought to trial, even though they said what? I, I'm not... You tell me I can't do what my Lord told me to do. I'm going to do what my Lord told me to do even when you tell me not to. And they were saved at that point, but they were killed later. Or John was put in exile. And so you have to be persistent and say, listen, I am going to do what is right even when the world says it is wrong. And so we must be persistent in our convictions. And thirdly, we must be prepared to witness. Well, let me back up for a moment just real quick. And that's why Peter says, you know, be, we're persistent in our convictions because he says, but in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord is holy. Sanctify Christ the Lord. That is, you're saying that I'm going to follow Christ no matter what. And then he says, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect. He says, give everybody a reason, a, a defense. Give everybody a reason for what you believe. Be prepared. Because when you do what is good, somebody's going to ask you, why, somebody may ask you, why are you doing this good thing? And sometimes when you're doing good and the world says it's wrong, they're going to ask you, why are you continuing to do this? And so Peter says, be prepared. Be prepared to give a defense, a reason for the hope that is in you, but do it with gentleness and respect. 
Don't, 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 you know, Paul would put it this way. Speak the truth in love. It does no good to yell at our opponents. It does no good to, to try to, you, you, you can't, you, you, you can't force people to believe the truth. But you can give them a reason defense. And, and for the hope that is in you. But, and, and let me just say right here. When, when, when Peter is saying give a reason. It's not, it's not, it's not, well because I have my best life now. <coughs> the reason that I trust Jesus is because I, <coughs> I have my best life now. Uh, we don't say, oh, I live this way because it makes me, uh, it makes me uh, uh, a better person. It makes me able to meet so many nice people. Because so many nice people are in church and I like nice people. We don't say, because I feel better about myself when, when, when I, uh, I clean up my act a little bit. We don't say, because it makes me a better person. You see, none of these things is a defense for what we believe. In fact, a Muslim can tell you the same thing. A Muslim can tell you, well, you know, I go to the, I go to the what, are, what do they call their, their temple? What do they call those things? Mosque. I couldn't think of it. Well, I go to the mosque because there's a lot of nice people there. and I feel better about myself and, and I'm becoming a better person. A Hindu can say that. An atheist can say those things. That's not the reason for the hope that is in us. The reason for the hope that is in us is that Jesus Christ has defeated hell, death, and the grave. But the reason for the hope that is in us is, is that I am forgiven not because of how good I am, but because of what Christ has done. And I get to go to heaven not because I'm a good person, but because Christ has made the way for me. That's the hope that is in us. The hope is not me being a better person. The hope is that it is Christ and Christ alone. And so when you do good and somebody asks you, why are you doing it? You just simply say, because Christ has been so good to me. Because Christ has been so good to me. And He has provided a way for me. And, and because He's provided a way for me, I just have joy in my heart and I want to look for ways to tell people about Christ. And can I tell you about what Christ has done? That's the hope that's in us. Thank you, sir. And so Paul Peter says, be prepared for that. Can I ask you a question? When, 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 when somebody asks you, why are you doing what are you doing? Do you, do you have already worked out to be able to point them to Christ? Are you, are you prepared already? See, that's a discipline. Because the, the easiest thing for us to say is, oh, no problems, I just, you know, no worries, I, I just enjoy doing it. Or you're welcome, no, you know, and we walk off. But you see, when somebody says thank you for doing good to them, that is a perfect opportunity to point people to Jesus. And to say, listen, you're welcome, but you know, I, I'm glad I can do it because, you know, Christ has done so much for me. And He can do so much for you as well. Let me tell you about it. That's what Peter's saying. He's saying, listen, when, when the world says thank you for doing good, point them to Jesus. And when the world kicks you for doing good, what should you do? Point them to Jesus. Give them a reason. Because sooner or later, somebody's going to ask you, why? Why did you do this? Why did you do this? And you can tell them about the hope that is in you. Because the only hope I have is not that I'm becoming a better person. Because I'll be honest with you, the longer I've been a Christian, I'm realizing the worst I've become. <laughs> That's sad, isn't it? 
And yet I feel like I'm in good company because Paul at the end of his life says, I'm the chief sinner. I'm not telling people, oh, because, man, it's such a great life now. Is it really? Yes, I, yeah, in some ways it is, but some ways it's like, you know, it'd be a whole lot easier. If, if I could, if I just did, if I just went along with the crowd. It'd be a whole lot easier. That's not the best life. The reason is because I have hope. And my hope is Jesus. My hope is Him. And so Peter, so Peter says, listen, okay, you want to you share the good news? All right, do good. And when people say, and when people say to you, thank you, point them to Jesus. And he says, listen, do good even when they call it wrong. And when they ask you, why are you this way? What do you do? You point them to Jesus. Be prepared. Be prepared. And finally, he says, be persuasive in faith. Now look at what happens here. Verse 16. Having a good conscience, so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. And I had to think about that passage of Scripture. How can, and, and because I had to ask myself the question, how can I have a good conscience? And you see, the only way I can have a good conscience is to trust the gospel. Because even when I do good, even when I do good, you know what my conscience says? You could have done more. Does anybody else have that problem? <clears throat> My conscience says, well, you could have done more. You could have done it better. And so my conscience constantly fights against me. And so the only way I can have a good conscience is to trust the gospel. And the, and the gospel says, I don't have to be good enough.
is the devil. He is the accuser of the brothers and sisters. I want to be inclusive in that. He's the one who slanders you and accuses you. I love the quote I read this week from Martin Luther. He said, I love it. He said, I rejoice when the devil calls me a sinner because Christ came to save sinners. I like that. I like that. And I can have a good conscience. I have a clear conscience today because I know that when God looks at me, He sees Christ in me. He's the hope of glory. And when I do those things, you know, because, because what happens when I don't have a clear conscience? If I'm not putting my hope in the gospel, then guess what? I'm, I'm not looking for ways to do good. I, I'm not looking for ways to stand for what's right. I'm not looking for ways to be a witness because it paralyzes me. <clears throat> and it keeps me from doing what is right. Ah, but when I trust the gospel and I know that my standing before God is Christ, it is, it is in Christ and Christ alone, and, and, and when, when I start feeling like, man, I'm not good enough, I, I start going, that's exactly right. I'm not good enough. But Christ is. And when I start feeling, oh, I'm such a sinner, I can say yes, because Christ saved sinners. He didn't come to call the righteous to repentance. He came to call sinners to repentance. I'm trusting Christ. And when I'm trusting Christ, I have that joy in my heart that says, I'm going to not get in my zone to get in and out as quickly as possible. I'm going to look for ways to bless other people and do good for them. Because I want to tell them when they say thank you. I want to say to them, it's because of Christ. And, and, and I'm going to stand for my convictions. Because when I stand for my convictions and the world says, why are you doing that? Because nobody else is. I can say, it's because of Christ. And I'm going to tell them about the hope that I have in me. And so Peter reminds us, now that is how you share the good news in a bad news world. So Father, thank you. Thank you today. Oh, thank you for Jesus. Mm. Lord, I don't say that enough. I am so grateful today that you have never told me to be good enough. <laughs> Actually, you made it worse, Lord. You told me to be perfect. And Lord, I knew I couldn't be. But you said, that's all right, I'll do it for you. And you gave me Christ. Oh, what joy. What joy that is to know that I am in Christ. To know that when I, that I don't have to fear, I can come boldly before you in prayer. And I can know that when I stand before you one day, Lord, all you're going to say to me is you're going to see Christ. And you're going to say, well done. Lord, that is so much joy that, Lord, I want to share it with others. 
And I want to find opportunities to do it. So give me this week an opportunity to do good for someone. Give me this week an opportunity just to bless someone. And I pray, Lord, that they'll say thank you. Because, Lord, that will be an opportunity for me to point them to Jesus. So, Lord, not only help me to do that good, Lord, help me to see that opportunity and to seize it so that I can tell somebody about the hope that's in me. So, Father, I pray that if each one of us does that this week, I believe it with all my heart, if each one of us plants a seed this week, one of those seeds will grow. You will give the increase. And we will hear next Sunday a testimony about how somebody came to know Christ this week. So Lord, help us to go and do good. For we ask it in Christ's name.